behind me, there's a, a church, the San Luigi dei Francesi in, um, in Rome. It's the French church in Rome. And San Luigi dei Francesi means the Saint Louis of the French. Saint Louis is the um, uh, Louis the Ninth, King of France, and he uh, brought back the crown of thorns and the Sacred Heart to France. And maybe you can see behind me there's lots of people coming in and out of this church. It's quite crowded inside. And that's not because this particular French church is so popular with the French or something. It's simply because of three paintings inside that are by Caravaggio that I'm going to show you um, as soon as I can get in there. So once you're inside, the chapel is actually on the left, all the way at the end, so near the apse. And that's where we're heading now. I, and I just love the fact that here in Rome, as in several other places in the world, of course, you can just walk into a church and you find one of these treasures of art history. Exactly where it's supposed to be, still in place, and in this case, just as Caravaggio left it. Now, it's called the Contarelli Chapel. And uh, it's named after its owner, which is... Matteo Contarelli. He was a cardinal in the 16th century and he bought this chapel and wanted it to be decorated in his name. And he was buried in this church as well. That actually kind of made sense because Contarelli, it sounds very Italian, but that's the Italian version of his name. He was actually a Frenchman called Mathieu Quantarel or something like that. I'm not sure about the pronunciation, so I put his name up there. But he was a cardinal here in Rome and that made him the cardinal priest of this church because this is the French church in Rome. Now he had bought this chapel and he wanted it to be decorated and he left detailed instructions and a bunch of money um, so that everybody knew what to do and could pay for it. Um, the instructions said that um, there was to be frescoes on the walls and a sculpture on the altar. They all had to be seen from the life of St. Matthew, because, of course, that's his name saint. On one wall, there would be the calling of Matthew, or as he put it, Matthew in his counting house. And on the other wall would be the martyrdom of St. Matthew. On the altar, there should be a sculpture of St. Matthew writing the Gospels. Now, Contarelli died in 1585, and his will stated all these things that he wanted to be done here and the executor of his will then simply started to well i guess drag his feet because for a long time nothing happened here it took at least five years so until 1590 until they they commissioned a couple of artists to start to work here and they hired a sculptor for the sculpture on the on on the altar by the name of jacques cobain now you may never have heard of him and that's that would be pretty normal because he's a virtual unknown he's not a very famous artist at all so you might think they uh, wanted to get a cheap artist to do all this and possibly they did but that would be in contrast to the painter that they hired because they also hired a painter for the for the frescoes and that was a man called giuseppe cesari i'm sure i botched that up as well spelling is up here again and he was better known as Cavalier d'Arpino. And he was actually the most sought after artist in all of Rome. You can find his work in churches all over the place and in palaces and everywhere. He's not that well known outside of the city, but, but he was one of the most famous artists of his generation. He had a huge workshop and he worked with lots and lots of different people. And he actually hired specialists to do certain jobs for him. And, and one of those specialists was a man called Caravaggio. The young Caravaggio actually worked for him painting uh, fruit and flowers, as one of his earlier biographers uh, put it. Basically still life elements. Something Caravaggio would have been very good at, by the way, because he had been trained in Milan and in northern Italy, these these uh, still life elements were much more popular to be painted, so people were trained at it better than they were in 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 Rome. A cavalier d'Arpino actually started working and uh, made some progress on painting on the um, on the vault, so in the upper part of the of the chapel, and he made a couple of scenes there, but then apparently stopped by 1593 he was called away to work on a project for the Pope, 
which was more prestigious, and so he left. As far as we know, Jacques Gobard never did anything, never started working. We have no evidence of him doing anything for this project. And then, for a couple of years, again, nothing happened in this chapel. About four years later, in 1597, the whole project was taken away from these executors of the will of Contarelli and was placed in the hands of, a, um, of an office of the church. And this office of the church was there to oversee all the building projects and decoration projects of all the churches in Rome. That office was very busy because three years later there would be a jubilee. In 1600 they would have a jubilee and they wanted everything to be in tip-top shape. And nobody wanted this, this church in Rome uh, to have a chapel boarded up because there was nothing to see here. Especially since there was a, um, a somewhat difficult relationship with France at the time. Their king, Henry IV, Henri IV, I suppose, had only recently become Catholic while saying the words, Paris is worth a mass, which did make some people wonder if he was really that sincere. But he had to be Catholic to be King of France, that was the idea. And they did expect for the Jubilee that lots of French people would visit the city, so they really wanted this church to be in good shape. Now the problem was that there were so many projects all over Rome that every artist of any repute was already at work. So it would be very difficult to find someone for this little chapel. And this is where a man called Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte comes into the story. Del Monte was uh, a cardinal and he worked at this office that handled all these projects and he was a fan of a young artist that kept getting into fights with everybody and that of course was Caravaggio. He got into fights with so many of his, of his employers and of his patrons that he was actually in need of a job. He would lost his house several times because he had been kicked out by people and uh, he actually lived in the house of Del Monte. And Del Monte lived right around the corner from this, this church in the Palazzo Madama. Caravaggio lived there as well. And he was more or less the house painter of, of Del Monte. And he made a whole series of paintings for him. Nowadays they're spread out throughout museums all over the world, but uh, at some point they all hung in his house. And Caravaggio had nothing to do. Del Monte needed a painter, so he set him to work on this project which was for Caravaggio the biggest project he had ever undertaken. He had only made relatively small paintings with only a few figures in them. Two, three, four at the most that interacted with one another. And the thing is, the more figures you place into a painting, the more difficult it becomes to make them interact in a sort of interesting way. And now he had to make these two very, very big uh, paintings with lots and lots of figures, because that's one of the, the things that, that Contarelli had asked for. He had said that he wanted lots of different figures in lots of different poses. Now for 1585 that was the fashion of the day. That, it makes perfect sense that he said something like that. But Caravaggio wasn't a specialist in that. To make things worse, he was asked to do this in July of 1599, and he had to have it done by May of 1600. So within a year he had to do something he had never done before, on a scale he had never worked on before, and he had to simply pull it off. They did allow him though to paint oil on canvas instead of fresco, because he had little experience in fresco and everybody was just afraid that there would be more delays. And Caravaggio set to work. He started out with the martyrdom of St. Matthew, that I'm going to discuss second. Why? Because, well, Caravaggio started on it, but he stopped. We know that he, he struggled with the composition because he worked on this one canvas that is still there and x-rays show us that he, at first, tried to make much more of a landscape on it with smaller figures to fit in with the, the demands of Contarelli. But he couldn't get it done. It, couldn't, it wasn't going to be an interesting painting. So he left it and he actually worked for a couple of months on, on simply other projects. He, he made a number of different paintings. And then he started on The Calling of St. Matthew. And The Calling of St. Matthew 
that was a lot easier for him for some reason. He, I guess he had a, a good idea of what he wanted to do. And it is one of the most spectacular paintings that he ever made. What we see is the calling of St. Matthew. It is a scene from the Gospels. It's mentioned in, in Matthew, Luke and Mark. The story is this. There was a counting house where tax was collected. Jesus came in and simply called Matthew. And in all the hubbub and all the busyness of, of a counting house, Matthew looked up, stood up and followed Jesus. Left everything behind. Apparently he was a rich man because that same night they had a banquet at his house. And from there he, he left his house, he left all his money and he, he followed Jesus. Now the scene that we see here is Jesus calling Matthew and Jesus is on the right. And strangely enough, we can barely see him because he's in the shade and we can just make him out because there's his head and his hand. The sunlight just catches them. And he is obscured mostly by St. Peter. St. Peter, by the way, we can recognize through the colors of the things he's wearing, of the, the clothing he's wearing. He has a yellowish sort of toga, I guess, and a blue undergarment. Jesus wears a reddish sort of color, and those were more or less standardized colors. There weren't actually fixed rules for these things, but there were customs. And uh, in many paintings you can recognize a saint or a, or a biblical figure simply by the colors of what they're wearing. And in this case, that's exactly what we're doing with, with St. Peter. Jesus has a halo that, of course, makes him more clearly Jesus, although the, the halo is barely visible. It's just this little line that you can see up there. So it's very subtle. And with a sort of effortless gesture, he calls Matthew. And here, just in that little part of this painting, Caravaggio did a number of very clever things. Most people know Caravaggio as the painter of often very gruesome scenes and um, with dirty hands, dirty fingernails, dirty feet, that sort of thing, and with light, light that he used to help his story. Well, that's exactly what he did here. But there's a lot more to Caravaggio than just a trick of light here and there and, and, um, and a bit of a dirty foot. He actually thought through his compositions in a way that that was new and exciting. And he did that here in, well, I'm going to show you exactly how he did that. There's this light that falls into the, into the room. It just brushes sort of over Jesus. And it is almost as if Jesus casts the light himself, which of course fits in very well with with the biblical narrative there there's all kinds of references of Jesus and light obviously there's he, he's the new light of the world he's the the truth and the light and and so on and so forth and so with this this sort of gesture where he, he almost seems to direct the light towards Matthew is uh, is a powerful thing to do besides that the chapel itself has a window above the altar and it sort of light sort of falls in along the same sort of line, depending, of course, on the time of day and the time of year and all that sort of thing. But, but it more or less does. And it, it's sort of convincing if you stand there that, that that's the light that, that falls in. So the natural light follows the painted light. But there's more to it. This, this almost hidden figure of, of Jesus does this with this, this sort of casual gesture. And that casual gesture is a recognizable one. And it's recognizable from a chapel just a couple of kilometers along the way. Um, and that's the Sistine Chapel. In the Sistine Chapel, there is, of course, this, this enormous ceiling with a lot of different scenes. And just one of those is the creation of Adam, where God appears and he gives life to Adam in their also pretty much effortless gestures that just barely don't touch. Now, if you look at it closely, at those hands, and you reverse them, you suddenly see that the hand of Adam is almost exactly the hand of Jesus. And that's an ever so subtle reference to that work by Michelangelo, 
linking Jesus to Adam, which is something that theology of the time really wanted you to say. Because the link between Adam and Jesus is that Jesus is undoing the original sin that Adam started. So all of that we see in just this part of the painting. Now if you move over to the left part of the painting, there's a, a whole group of men there. And something you might almost miss if, if it's not pointed out to you, but all these people are wearing clothing from the time of Caravaggio. Jesus and St. Peter are wearing sort of toga-ish like garments, uh, the sort of thing that people imagined that uh, people in the time of Christ actually wore. But the people around the table, these, these men that are sitting there, they're all dressed as, well, anyone at the time of Caravaggio. The thing is, they are, well, in a tax collector's office because Matthew was a tax collector and they're in a counting house. And we can see that very clearly because there's a man counting coins. And in fact, there's two, perhaps three, because one is, is almost completely hidden, people that are, are very much engrossed in, in this counting process. And there's counting and accounting because there's, well, the coins that you see on the table, but there's also a book and a, and a quill and ink. So, so that, I suppose, is the accounting part. And there's a bag of money as well. So everything there has to do with earthly matters and, well, money. And as Jesus comes in, the two young gentlemen sitting closest to him, probably the people who are paying the money, um, are called away, their attention is called away by Jesus, but only one of them actually points, and that's the bearded guy. There's actually been a, a, a fair bit of discussion about who is actually Matthew in this painting, because the man with the beard points, well, either to himself in a sort of who me gesture, or he points to the young man counting the coins. So either of them could be Matthew. I am of the opinion that the man with the beard is Matthew because the two other paintings in the, uh, in the same chapel featured that same man with that same beard as St. Matthew. So it, it's not really a, a sensible discussion, I think. So to me, it's obviously that man is Matthew. He looks Jesus in the eye and says, who me? then gets up and leaves everything. Now this whole setting of having people sitting in, in clothing of their own time makes them ordinary people. And it also happens to make this story not just one biblical account, but something that could occur at any time. What I mean to say is that it becomes a spiritual thing. All over Rome and all over the world, people are busy with their own daily lives. They're doing the accounting and the counting of money and, and making money and spending it and or whatever. And it is very easy to miss the important calls in the world. If Jesus were to call you, would you listen? That's the question it, it really asks. It is as if the story of the Bible is still happening today, as if anyone could be called by faith. And that's exactly what the, the church wanted the story of the Bible to be, to be a living story that still happened at that time. It is one of the great narratives of the Counter-Reformation. So this really fit in with what the church wanted paintings to say. Now, all of that, all that narrative, all these different stories and different intentions, you can all find them in this one painting. And that is why it's such a brilliant one. And he actually did it well, probably in a couple of months. So then he turned his attention to the martyrdom of St. Matthew. And the stipulations in the contract, what, what Contarelli had left, said that there should be architecture there and there should be an assassin there because there's, the story of the martyrdom of St. Matthew is n not in the Bible. It is a, a traditional story and the tradition has it that there was a king of Ethiopia who sent an assassin to Matthew because the king of Ethiopia uh, was in love with his own niece, but the niece was a nun, and Matthew said that therefore she was a bride of Christ, and so he should keep his hands to himself. And the king of Ethiopia didn't like that, so he sent an assassin to kill him. Well, that's the story that we see here. The assassin, 
is that very un-Ethiopian looking man standing over St. Matthew, who was saying Mass in a church and is attacked and is killed by this man with a sword, who inexplicably is almost naked. Now around him are all kinds of people in different clothing, in different dress, and they show appropriate emotions. And that's one of the things that Contarelli wanted in, his, in these paintings. And you can see they are either scared, or they are uh, disgusted, or they are fearful for their own lives. And there's, there's one man looking down upon it with quite, well, actually little emotion, and that's this man in the back. And that might very well be a self-portrait of Caravaggio, especially if you compare it to this portrait. Now we also see St. Matthew on the ground, on the floor, being murdered, and his hand with which he wanted to defend himself is, is pulled away by the assassin. But at the very same moment, an angel comes from heaven and hands him this palm, which makes him a martyr, and brings him straight to heaven. Now, the way St. Matthew is positioned is quite typical and is actually not new. There is a painting by Titian that has someone in exactly the same sort of attitude. It is, in this case, it's not St. Matthew, it's the assassination of St. Peter Martyr. Titian had painted it for the Santi Giovanni a Paolo in Venice, but it had been copied quite a few times. It was a popular painting and probably Caravaggio saw it. Well, definitely you saw a reproduction of it or something like that because, well, he, he made him in this sort of mirror image. By the way, the original Batician has been lost. In the 18th century, it was destroyed in the fire. But it has been replaced by one of its many copies because it was copied so many times in earlier centuries. So today, in the Santi Giovanni e Paolo in Venice, you see this copy by a man called Johann Karl Lott. Now that basically concluded the work that Caravaggio was going to do in the chapel. And he finished it, well, more or less in time. It was only about a month late. So I think everybody was very happy with that. And you have to imagine that the work he had done before was all smaller paintings and paintings to be hung in people's homes. And it's very hard to get a reputation if you only paint things that are in people's homes. This was his first large public work and that meant that lots and lots of different people were going to see it and when it was in, unveiled in 1600 it caused a stir all over rome especially young artists loved this the older artists all despised it hated it they said but the younger generation loved it and it it made his fame and it started this whole copying of caravaggio and that's why we have caravaggisti because they saw this and they started to think, this is what we want to do as well. So actually this chapel represents a, a key moment in art history. Now there is of course another painting in the chapel. Um, there was supposed to be a sculpture of St. Matthew writing the Gospels. But by the time that these, these two paintings had been made, most of the money that Contarelli had left had simply disappeared. There was nobody knew where it was and so they really didn't have any money left for a for a sculpture because they're a lot more expensive than paintings. And a few years later they asked Caravaggio to come back and paint the last painting. And that has a story in and of itself because he had to do that twice. And the reason he had to do it twice is because the first one was rejected. This is that first version and we have to understand that the subject of Matthew writing the Gospels is not a unique one. You see them all over the place. Usually you see all the four evangelists together all with their, uh, their animal. They each have an, an animal that is their attribute. For all kinds of theological reasons they have that particular animal. That well, animal, uh, in the case of Matthew, is the angel. And usually these evangelists look like well, philosophers in a toga with a, a big halo around their head and, and they're assisted by their animal, or in this case the angel, and they inspire them. But Caravaggio went a different way. 
what we see here is a sort of a reimagining by Caravaggio of the story of Matthew. What he did is he he applied his own form of realism to the whole scene. Apparently, I suppose, he thought about what the life of Matthew would have been like. Because, of course, what we know from the Bible is that he he was a tax collector, he had money, and then he followed Jesus and he left everything behind. He was witness to all of the miracles and all of the all of the events of, of the life of Jesus, and then spent the rest of his own life trying to tell people about it. And I suppose most people didn't believe him. And all of that time he was poor. He had a hard life. And we can see that in the figure of this Matthew, because his muscles are, are strong, even though he's an older man. And you can see that in his legs, you can see it in his arms, that forearm that has these, these bulging muscles and these, these veins popping out. Now this has to do with, with age and, well, use. Also, he doesn't wear any shoes. That is not unusual for the, this sort of picture, but in this case, because he doesn't have any shoes, he has dirt on the soles of his feet. And his toenails are cracked. They're dirty. He's bald. Uh, and the little bit of hair that he does have is unkempt. He, uh, you can see that over, over his head, the, the hairs are sticking out. Also, he doesn't look very inspired. He looks kind of confused. And he holds his pen clumsily. So much so that the angel seems to have stepped in and, and is guiding his hand. So it's actually assisting him literally to, to move the pen across the paper. And I think this is a very touching version because the thing is, you can see the sort of confusion in his eyes and the, the, the way he tries to, to remember this extraordinary life that he had and, and the hardships he had, you can see all of that in that face and in that body and in that posture of his. All the hardships come together and he's trying to write it down for posterity. And, and perhaps he, he realizes that most people cannot possibly believe what he has seen. Now to me that is one of the most impressive paintings ever. But to the church in Rome it was a bridge too far. You couldn't really have a, 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 a saint an evangelist being dirty like this or confused like this. He could be a beggar, but we know he isn't. He doesn't even have a halo to tell us that he's a saint. So they rejected this version and it was sold off to someone else. And there's a reason that you can only see a black and white picture of it because it was sold and it ended up eventually in Dresden, where it still was in 1945. And that is where it was destroyed in the bombings. Although there is a second narrative, some people say that it was moved before the bombing and it was transported to Berlin, where it was destroyed in a bombing a few weeks later. But anyway, it was destroyed, and that's why we have only this one black and white picture of it. Online you can find versions where it has been colored in, but I prefer the black and white because it, I can imagine the colors for myself. But anyway, Caravaggio had to try again. He had to do it all over again. And he, he made a second version that is much more to the liking of the church, and they accepted this one immediately. And here in this version, that of course is still in the, in the chapel, you can see Matthew dressed as a philosopher. He has a halo that is subtle, but very much visible. And uh, the toga and everything, it makes him look intellectual. And he's sitting at a table, or sort of, crouching on a, on a bench and writing by himself. He, he's writing on his own accord. And an angel is there just to remind him of everything. And you can see that in the gestures of the angel. You can see that the angel is sort of telling him stuff and he's and it's counting the events off on his finger. See that? The, the number one happened, the number two happened, the number three happened. All of that you see in these, these gestures of the hands. And it's sort of a rapport. They, they seem to be talking to each other. He's also sort of leaning precariously on that, that bench of his. And if you look down, you can see that that bench is about to fall over. If he releases it, if he lifts his knee up, that bench will fall out of the picture. Because it's, it, it comes almost to the outside of the picture frame. It makes uh, for a bit of movement in the picture. Actually, I'm quite curious, which one would you prefer? The, the second version or the first version? Why don't you just let me know in the comments? It would be fun to know. 
Well, this is the story I wanted to tell you today. The story of this wonderful chapel that has three Caravaggios inside and, and really made the name and fame of Caravaggio. And you can, of course, simply go and visit them for yourself. They're in Rome. The San Luigi dei Francesi is more or less in between the Piazza Navona and the Pantheon, so it's not really that hard to find. If you like this story, give me a thumbs up, and this would, of course, also be an excellent moment to subscribe to my channel. You know that is the way that you can find my videos more easily. You can also hit that little uh, bell icon that appears, and then you'll be notified anytime I post new videos. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, and um, I hope to see you again soon. Bye.